It's my pleasure to introduce our first speakers in, in this afternoon's session on residential energy consumption. And uh, Dora Costa and Matt Kahn, to the best of my knowledge, the only married couple on the panel this afternoon, are going to speak about um, household variation in residential electricity purchases. Thank you very much, Dora. Or Matt? Matt goes first. Bob. Thank you. Folks, we're, we're delighted to be here. Let's see. Hey. And so we, we, we have a better title, uh, but, but it, it, at the end of the day, we're going to have uh, 50 million data points. And uh, armed with 50 million data points, I, I think we nicely build on, on some of the papers we heard this morning. Uh, it, it, we have focused the paper, uh, and perhaps we have too much material, as uh, some of our discussants have, have told us. But it, it, we think we have new things to say on both the important time series point of the Rosenfeld curve, and so the core fact. Uh, e e residential electricity consumption over this 37-year period has increased 60% for the nation, but only by 24% for California. And so this is a cut of the Rosenfeld curve, or the California exceptionalism. Folks, we're going to be doing uh, microdata, uh, like Matt and Grant. Uh, we're sort of a cousin. In Sacramento, there's a huge, with, at any point in time, huge variation in household residential electricity consumption. Take the monthly SMUD electricity bills that we'll have much more to say about in a couple of minutes. Sort the households, sort the 500,000 households from the smallest footprint to the Shaquille O'Neal. Uh, and, and take the 90th percentile to the 10th percentile, and it's seven every year of, of this. Uh, and, and so just huge within, uh, within, at any point in time, in any month sample variation. Folks, we think we have a consistent story for both uh, explaining both the time series and the cross-section. And a, in the flavor of a, the, the recent heterogeneity work that economists continue to do, there's going to be some interesting aggregation issues. Uh, Dora is a newcomer to energy economics. I hope all of you welcome her. Yay! Woo! T uh, tough crowd. But uh, one of the reasons I married her is, uh, is she's a, a terrific... <laughs> John, she's she's a, a terrific demographer, and uh, some of the <laughs> like the Gong Show, the uh, it, 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 some ideas from demography will come out here. The birth cohort: when was your home born? Uh, how old is the home? We're going to downplay aging effects, calendar year effects of what's the price of electricity, what's the weather outside. Some basic ideas from demography are going to be quite useful for thinking about uh, residential energy consumption. So welcome on board. At the heart of this project is good data. And uh, we have been very fortunate to be having a, a good relationship up till now with our friends at SMUD. And uh, we're going to be talking about too many different data sets. But I, I know we had a good lunch, and I ate two of them. Uh, uh, and and I, uh, it, it was compliments of the excellent talks. But, but uh, Professor Knittle challenged me to a, uh, and we kept, it was an arms race, but I, it, please keep in mind, in what we're about to talk about, there's seven different data sets. And so I don't want to work the laser. E, traditional data, a little bit like Matt and Grant stuff, will be monthly residential electricity consumption from SMUD. And folks, Sacramento actually looks a lot like the rest of the country on average. Similar education, pretty similar income, uh, more, a, a little less white than the rest of the country. But Sacramento, we don't want to be pigeonholed as a little case study. They, while our data is from Sacramento, e, Sacramento is a little bit of a Peoria a convenient for us. So we have, we have the universe of residential electricity consumption from 2000 till now in Sacramento. Point number two, a little bit distinguishing us from other recent excellent studies on electricity consumption is a, this credit bureau data from this snapshot in 2008. So hypothetically, if there is a white guy who is 43 years old with a certain income living in a 1,700 square foot house built in 1962 at an exact street address, we will know it. And so a distinguishing feature from our work, and we'll be able to show you many results because of this, is knowing who is in the household, who is in the home, who is the household, and being able to estimate some more interesting statistical models because of this sophisticated, uh, high-quality data. This was alluded to before. 
in my own work, in which I've, I've, Doris heard about too much, I've been very interested in how liberals slash environmentalists live their lives. As a University of Chicago economist, my old teachers had hoped that I'd write a paper called Hypocrites. That, uh, that, 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 that liberals, and put these, uh, think of Berkeley, that uh, talk a good game in public, but then eat their steak sandwiches and have a huge footprint at home. But a theme that's gonna come out of our work is that liberals walk the walk. And, 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 and so, uh, we, uh, and so uh, maybe I will be invited back. And so, uh, it, all else equal, and uh, Dora will get to the details, uh, all else equal, people who live in environmental communities, in environmentalist communities, either proxied for by political party of registration or where there's a lot of Priuses registered, or have a smaller uh, electricity bill. Folks, something funky we did in four. We recognize that old homes can be made new again through renovation. And so we harassed the city uh, of Sacramento for all their renovation data for the last five years. Now, we don't have illegal renovation. Steve Levitt would figure out how to get that. But if you have permitted your renovation, we've got you. So we're going to be able to answer the question with household fixed effects. If you renovate your house, does your electricity consumption fall? So, so a within estimator. Folks, uh, we also know about who the 273 households who installed solar panels, and these are all friends of Severin's, and that's uh, and a, a question we're gonna ask there, coming to something uh, John Quigley asked before, is we're in point six, we're also gonna have data on every home sale in Sacramento from 2003 to 2009. We're gonna show some evidence at the end of the paper that uh, hedonics, some new hedonics uh, on home pricing. Electricity consumption, energy efficiency, non-salient stuff is not capitalized. But those homes that have solar, there's a 7% price premium. And we recognize that that parameter will be debated, and, and Dora will speak about that for a moment, in a moment. Another new result that comes out is the year a home is born. So if a home was born in 1977, in the year 2000, if a home was born in 1977, and so it's, it's 33 years old at that time, if you were born, or 23, I can't do the math, if you were born in 1977, back in year 2000, your energy consumption today depends on energy prices in the year the house was built. If the home was built during a time of cheap energy, then 30 years later, it still has high energy consumption. And we find that an interesting result that we haven't seen in the literature. Folks, like much of the literature, I first want to tell you what we don't do. We are well aware that a household's electricity consumption is a sum of a bunch of independent or activities. You choose a house, you choose your appliances, and you choose whether to renovate the house, and you choose how to utilize the durables in your house. So we're well aware that there's an implicit household production framework here. Let's do one example of what we're not doing. And for folks in the room who know Reese and White's restud paper, uh, we respect what they did in their paper, but we're not able to do the following. Uh, suppose the only piece of electricity consumption in your house is how often uh, you run your dishwasher then if you pick an energy efficient dishwasher, then your total electricity consumption comes down to how many loads you do. And then the marginal price you face per economic activity is, uh, it depends if you have a more energy efficient product, then you face a lower price per load. This is not what we're gonna be doing here, but we are well aware that, uh, let's focus on the positive, what we do do. We're gonna be observing and trying to explain household monthly electricity consumption, which is a function of all these subcategories. But we, we, we wish we could disaggregate household choice as a function of each of these subcategories, but this, we're gonna be adding all of these up to, S, to present the statistical models we're about to show you. Folks, what we're up to. What Dora will be talking you through in just a moment, and this is similar to Matt and Grant's framework, and, and I, it, but with, we're able to use some of the data that at least right now they don't have. We're gonna be looking at the, the log of a household's monthly electricity consumption. We're gonna know from our credit bureau data the specific household's income. So this is not zip code income. This is the household's income. We're gonna know their age, ethnicity, and a bunch of other demographics in our paper. We're gonna have the characteristics of the house. Does it have a swimming pool? It's square footage, year built. Uh, is it an electric home? 
We're going to have these indicators of the political ideology of your block. Sacramento can be partitioned into 795 neighborhoods, and we will use that data. Temp is temperature. Folks, the paper, if you read it carefully, is not terrific on price the price of electricity. We recognize that demand curves slope down, but unlike in other utility districts in California, SMUD has not had that interesting energy price dynamics, especially relative to what Severin was studying in his setting. There are three pricing tiers. There's higher prices during the summer. And so we're going to be presenting these regressions. But if someone said, Matt, you are an economist. You, you have heard of price. Uh, it, what we will be showing you is we will borrow from Reese and White who a, in, a re, in their restud paper estimated a, an elasticity of minus 0.39. We're going to do a trick, and I'm going to test you to see if anyone buys this trick. We're going to transform, we're going to take their coefficient and restrict the price coefficient and then redefine the dependent variable because we are able to use our microdata to calculate the price that every household faces in every month, but th that's endogenous in a rising block system. And so instead of estimating that thing, we're going to impose this restriction and see how our estimates of beta 1 through beta 6 are affected when you make this price adjustment. Folks look thrilled. But if you don't do this, you are subject to the criticism, well, how do prices enter this system? But that's not a primary focus of our exercise. Folks, what we're then going to do is we're going to ask the following question. One of the data sets I didn't tell you about is SMUD for a subsample of 1,000 households asked detailed questions, what durables do you have in your house? So it might have been the case that richer people consume more electricity, they run their plasma TV more, but maybe they have newer appliances. And so that would affect the coefficient you estimate beta 1, the marginal effective income on energy consumption. To get at that, we, Dora will be presenting specifications where we control for the durables it, 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 how many re refrigerators you have, the age of appliances within the household, and then to see how our coefficients change as we include this durable stock. I already mentioned this, that we will take a look at how a household's electricity consumption varies as a function of the price of electricity in the year it's born. And we, we think that's interesting, uh, interesting contribution to the demography of studying household energy consumption. And do I want to do one more? I mentioned that we also, in addition to running cross-sectional regressions, will be running panel regressions with household fixed effects and taking a look at the following three issues. For households who renovate, does their electricity consumption decline? As the state ran its massive Flex Your Energy campaigns, does energy consumption decline? Using within household price Using average monthly prices, I apologize, using average monthly prices, how do those, an exogenous variable, how do those affect electricity consumption? I think with that, do this one. I'll do one more. And they, I apologize. And so it, the key hypotheses that Dora will be walking you through on the cross section, and we know that there's a lot here, and we know we have 22 minutes. It, we're going to take, like Grant and Matt, we're going to take a look at California's building codes, and we're going to have some interesting results. We're going to have results on household demographics, the size of the home, and uh, it, with respect to income of how much electricity consumption households consume. We've already discussed the liberal environmentalist result, that all else equal, liberal environmentalist households are consuming less. And our explanation comes through number four that all else equal, liberal environmentalist households have newer durables in their homes. And a, finally, I've mentioned this twice, if your house was built in a year in an electric utility zone where prices were high, your energy consumption will be lower. And we will use all of these pieces of evidence to do a decomposition that helps us to explain the Rosenfeld puzzle. So, so the final point I would make is by documenting cross-sectional coefficients, we then can ask how each of these variables changes over time to try to explain the Rosenfeld time series. And that's what we're out to do. So those of you who've seen us present together before will know that Matt always starts because he's the funny one. I'm more like Spock, so I give you just straight the facts. <laughs> so this is... So let's start off with our cross-sectional 2008 regression, roughly 2.5 million data points, where uh, a data point is a household and a billing cycle. 
And these are the coefficients on our year-built dummies, where the omitted variable here is built before 1960. And one of the things that you will immediately notice here is uh, the building codes come in, but nonetheless, the houses that are built at the end of the 1970s and early 1980s are badly constructed homes in terms of energy efficiency. Later on, we do get the steep declines, but these are bad houses. A few more results from our cross-sectional data. In terms of, we get a small income elasticity. This is controlling for everything, including square footage, of roughly 0 0.06. And if you, I, we forgot to put up the Multiply square footage. Two, oh, go ahead. We forgot to put up the square footage up there, but for the square footage, our coefficient is 0.4. So square footage does matter a lot. One of the variables that Matt is always particularly interested in is the hybrid share in the block. And here, this comes out as being, again, very important. Yes, if you are in a liberal block, you're going to be consuming less electricity. Fraction liberal, where liberal is, me is measured as Democrat, peace and freedom, and uh, what was the other one? Green. 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 Thank you. <laughs> And so we have. We made this complicated that we have the interaction here. But, yeah. but it, so you may yeah. do that. So when we, what is complicated here is we do have an interaction. And uh, if you look at sort of any reasonable temperature things, liberals do consume less electricity. Similarly, people purchase for six or $12 extra per billing cycle, you can uh, get your energy from 50% uh, green sources or 100% green sources. People who do this consume less electricity. One of the other things that we can do, and this is done in a much smaller data set, we only have about 497 households, is we can control for the type of appliances the type of households have. And one of the things that comes out from this data set is why do liberals purchase less electricity? And liberals particularly <coughs> purchase less when it's a hot day. It's, uh, they have newer appliances and they have fewer refrigerators. So clearly they're not the people who are plugging in the old refrigerator in their garage. They do still have the same number of LCD screens. New appliances, the other thing that we found interesting from this regression is what happens to our building code dummies. And basically only after 2003 would we actually get any type of effect of new appliances on building code dummies. One of the things that we're still really puzzled by is why do we get this big increase even after codes come in in terms of electricity consumption of these end of the 1970s homes. And what is striking is if you look at electricity prices in California and the rest of the nation, in California in the 1970s, electricity prices were relatively low compared to the rest of the country. If you look at how much we went to the 2000 census, if you look at the price of electricity in your utility district in the year your house was built, birth year matters. The price matters a lot. And it can actually explain some of our building year dummies effects. So before 1980, and unfortunately we can't look specifically by year, we only have broad aggregates for pre-1980. Our birth year, it shrinks our birth year dummies by 25 to 30%. We also have panel data. And here what we're interested in knowing is what does a home renovation do? Can you get a complete, do you get a completely new house when you do a home renovation? The answer is gonna be no. Uh, we're also, interested in finding out, looking more thoroughly at 
monthly electricity prices, we have some variation. It's not very much, so we don't do a great job on that. The other thing that we can also look at in further detail is do liberal and environmentalist blocks, are they less likely to increase their electricity consumption when the temperature is higher? And we also look at this media campaign from uh, 2001 to 2002, Flex Your Energy, to find out how effective was it at encouraging conservation. One of the things I should point out is that houses do age, but uh, we don't find that, at least in terms of energy efficiency, there's much of an aging effect. So some of our uh, interesting results for renovations. Square footage increases energy usage. A roof has maybe 2% decline in uh, energy usage. New kitchens also ele increase electricity usage. We don't know if this is because people still keep their old refrigerator. And yes, getting in a new HVAC system decreases electricity usage, but for most of the temperatures that prevail in Sacramento, there's a rebound effect. So basically, a new HVAC increases electricity usage. Turning to our flex, looking at uh, further things about the panel data, and these results are both for owners and renters. Previously, we just looked at homeowners. Price, we find a small elasticity. It's insignificant. Part of this could be we simply don't have that much variation in the data. We do find that temperature times the fraction liberal matters, so liberals, again, reduce their energy consumption. For the Flex campaign, and this was an extremely intensive campaign at the beginning of particularly 2001, trying to get people to reduce their electricity usage. It was very salient because the previous summer there had been blackouts. The nature of the campaign changed over time. They tried to convince people to uh, get into greener durables. We find only an initial effect, but there's no lasting effect. So even though the campaign lasted until the end of 2002, Nothing. Uh, do energy efficiency investments make a home appreciate in value? We merged sales data for Sacramento County to our data. And one of the things we investigated was in Sacramento County, is there an energy premium? Is there a sales price premium for low energy homes? If we look at actual energy usage, and we're able to enter in energy usage in uh, some months prior to the sale, trying to take into account when the house might have been empty, we don't find that that matters. If anything, it's uh, the energy using homes, which may be the nicer homes, uh, sell for a premium. We do, however, find that the electric homes sell for a discount. The 1970s homes, relative to pre-1960, actually sell for a slight premium. So it's certainly possible that people are not aware that there are these problems with the 1970s energy, with the housing stock. This more sexy is Matt's line. I don't find solar panels that sexy. I'll have to have Matt explain to me why. But uh, we're now going to turn to, are these things capitalized in the solar panel? And we, a caveat is we've only got some 237 homes that are solar homes. They may well be the nicer homes, even though we can control for pool and various other characteristics. We can't say much. But we do find that they sell for a 7% premium, which is, given Sacramento prices, it's about $24,000. And the typical price for a solar installation is about $30,000. So one thing which maybe we can conclude from this, but of course it might only be suggestive, is if it's a visible energy improvement, that may be capitalized. Uh, decomposition of the time series. 
think one of the most interesting part is how much can we explain of the Rosenfeld puzzle? So using our regression coefficients, we're sort of asking, is a smut homeowner given 1970 level of income, liberalism, home size, and housing stock age, how would electricity consumption be changed? And demographics matters a lot. So we're sort of running out of time, so let me just quickly go through this. But demographics matters a lot. Square footage also matters a lot. Uh, income matters, but not as much. And housing stock age is also important, but liberals are important too. And of course here, it's, we're not taking into account uh, what being a Democrat means in 1970 versus uh, today. <laughs> So if you're accounting for the Rosenfeld curve, just per, on an annual basis, roughly uh, over 4,000 kilowatt hours per customer between difference between California and the rest of the nation in 2007. The smaller size of California homes accounts for most of the difference. Land is expensive here. Per customer per household. The earlier slide you said per household. This is per customer. It's uh, California homes are smaller, building clo codes explain roughly 7% of the difference. Demographics, it can't be it. California household heads tend to be younger, living with more family members. Liberals, we can't tell. We're not going to compare Southern Democrats with California Democrats. <laughs> so I think we're out of time, but basically one of our conclusions is, look, with the cross-sectional data, we can explain a lot of uh, the aggregate time series, which is just sort of this uh, heterogeneous set. And let me get in a pitch for importance of history. The past is still with us. It's with us in our housing stock. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is, I'm going to mispronounce his name. He'll pronounce it correctly when he gets here. It's Dirk Brownen. And he's going to speak on the economics of energy labels in the housing market. Dirk? It was a perfect pronunciation, but these are not my slides. Uh, <laughs> no, looks more familiar. OK, well. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here for a couple of days. So thank you for the organizers for inviting me over here. Uh, this paper is uh, joint work with Niels Koch. And indeed, we are not a married couple. We are both Dutch, so everything is possible. But <laughs> and he's, he's a handsome looking guy. But uh, I, I only have 26 more minutes. So I'll focus to the, to the core at the moment. Uh, I came here to, uh, to talk about the paper, and the current title is On the Economics of Energy Labels in the Housing Market. And what I will do is I'll take you 26 minutes away from the US, because we have uh, European data to do so. Uh, when I was preparing this slide, I also uh, remembered the last time that John Quickly and I met was at the Homo Hoyt Institute, and then Niels was giving a presentation. And I was making this slide, and Niels was giving a very fine presentation, but John was harassing him on naming states in the US. And Niels had a very hard time. So this will be like a revenge also, because <laughs> I took away all these names over here. And, and this, this part will really fascinate me over here. I'm, say, I'm saying Latvia, Lithuania, Slovenia, Slovakia. And you can make two mistakes. No, I mean. And sustainability in the real estate markets in Europe is a big issue. And let's say as a follow-up on the Kyoto Protocol, uh, in 2003, we had the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive, um, which meant, and there's a statement I will project into Russia here, which is important, member states shall ensure that when buildings are constructed, sold or rented out, an energy performance certificate is made available by the owner to either the buyer or tenant. And this is meant to be mandatory. So this was 2003, almost seven years later now. Um, and this is the reason why I have this slide. In green and red, I'm indicating whether this has been adopted and implemented by now. And if you count quickly, uh, of the 25 countries that we did a survey on, 14 did not yet do this. And 11 did. Uh, so we're still working on it. People are talking about definitions, uh, laws, and legislation. It's going relatively slow. Um, so we're looking at the European market. And to be exact, I will take you over 
over here, here, the beautiful country of the Netherlands, because we were at the moment European champion in this implementation. We were the first to do this on a vast scale. So this is the, the sample in the laboratory. Here is the small country on a bigger size. This is the Netherlands, and I give you some backgrounds because during this morning and this, this, this afternoon lunch, I also um, realized that we have a very different setting. I think it's good to maybe to be aware of that. Um, population 16.55 million, home 7.2, that's not that important. Own, ownership level 55%, that's interesting, but not hugely relevant. Temperature, that's maybe relevant also. Uh, to position is 50 degrees Fahrenheit is the average over the year, and the winters go into 35, summers up to 70s. So what is very important why I say this is uh, we don't really have air conditioning in houses. That's not an issue because we don't really cool, do cool them here. The average price of a typical home in the owner market is 230,000 euros. Um, if you look at the monthly charge on interest on your mortgage, that's 800 net. We have a tax deductibility system. That's the monthly bill you will have buying the average home in the Netherlands. And this will shock your world a bit. This is our gas bill every month, 105 euros, because we heat our home. Heating is much more important than cooling. And our elect electricity bill is 53 euros. I had the feeling after lunch that these numbers look a little bit different in the US. So at the moment, it's 160 euros total on the average, which is about 20% of what people face in the mortgage every month. So this is not very irrelevant. People are very much aware of this. And we are Dutch also. It's one of the prejudices that we are greedy and stingy people, which of course is not really true. But if that is the case, we, we realize what 160 euros mean every month. It's a great laboratory. This is the um, energy certificate. This is what we implemented in 2008 on January 1st as the first European country. It was mandatory initially. So every time, like in this EPBD directive, when you sell a home, you need to offer this to the buyer. So it's, uh, it's relatively simple. I think we should add smileys uh, on this. Uh, but I mean green, red. So we've got, in this case, um, seven categories. And this is scaled on an actual energy consumption. Now, I said this was initially mandatory. It is mandatory, but after a month, people found out that you can sign a waiver. So if you are the buyer of the home, if you sign the waiver, the, the seller does no longer have to take this certificate. And the certificate will cost 150 euros. Um, and there were a lot of people now finding out the waiver and try to circumvent it. And I will show you statistics on how large that uh, scale is at the moment. So what we have is, uh, we think, very interesting data. But of course, after seeing US data all day, I mean, it's a small country, to be honest. But we have quite cool stuff. Here we go. We have a sample of 175,875 sales, which is almost 70% of everything that was sold in the, in the Netherlands since January 1st, 2008. The period is this, of course, because uh, that's when the energy certificates was impl implemented. We've got housing data, so we know quite a lot. I think 18 different variables on housing characteristics on age, size, type, location, but also things like insulation and heating. And this is coming to us from the Real Estate Association, and they inspect all these homes. NVM is short for the Realtor Association. Now we connect that data set to the uh, data set of the Energy Certificate uh, Institution, which is part of the Dutch uh, Ministry of Economic Affairs, Centre Novum, and they know, they tell us whether there has been an energy certificate because they keep record of that and what the class and category has been, A till G. We also have data on neighbourhoods, so we know about density, home values, time on the market, whether it's a hot or popular neighbourhood, and that is given to us by the Central Bureau of Statistics. And, and we are also big fans of, uh, of work of uh, Matt, so that's also why we took the voting behaviour in on the six-digit lock level. So we know whether people, and we call that green voting because we have a green party and we even have, I think it's the only country in the, in the world that we have a, an animal party. Actually, they have a seat in our parliament. Everything is possible in the Netherlands. And <laughs> these two parties have very strong uh, green, uh, let's say, agenda. So we, we can register whether people in the neighborhood are more inclined to, to vote this way and whether that is connected to their behavior, in this case, on taking an energy certificate. So this is a data set. And I have a massive tables. I'm really glad that we have such a big screen because I was a little bit worried about this. Uh, this is actually only a snapshot of the table that is in the paper. So you can look at that at your convenience. These are summer statistics. So I highlight some things that are maybe noteworthy here. So it, it starts with, with uh, in this case, on the left side, certified dwellings. Not all of the transactions, of course, have been certified with an energy label. On the right side, you have the, the sample that has not been certified. 
And the difference is here, transaction prices, time on the market, so how long does it take to sell, uh, discount, so we know exactly the initial asking price and the transaction price for which it was sold, but these are not really that, that different. What is different and maybe a bit more appealing is that the certified dwellings are a little bit smaller, this is in square meters. We also see that, for instance, if you look at the period of construction, let's say the birth year we just saw, that indeed we see a little bit of overrepresentation in the relatively young classes, but um, we will also look at this in a more statistical uh, sense. And, and we know much more about these houses, houses than in this table, but maybe it's good also to show that, for instance, when people think about insulation, you think, well, you're the owner of a home, you know it's doing very well in energy-wise, and you just want to have the certificate to signal that. That's not really the case, because, for instance, insulation being graded as good is actually even lower for the certified dwellings than they are for the non-certified. So it's not just a tactical move, apparently. <coughs> So the lower part I also paste in. I had to paste in a lot of parts of the tables. Uh, you might also wonder about the distribution of these energy labels. It's A till G, A being the best, but it's only 0.6, 7%. It's really the case. This is a very stringent uh, category. Uh, most of it, almost 70%, is between C and E, which is the, the typical plain vanilla. But also G is 7.5%, and these are the really wasteful homes. Uh, down there, you also see the distribution over periods. So this is when were the transaction, when did they take place? And you see that that goes down quite sharply. There are two reasons for this. Um, if you look at the right side, I can point it over here. At least, well, battery ran out. Oh, that's a pity. But at the right side, you see 70.71 down to 6.14. That's the same trend downwards. That's simply because of the economic recession. Also in the Netherlands, house prices, or house sales have run down, so we have less sales now than we had a year ago. But also, the adoption rate of the energy label I will show you has run down, so that's why at the green arrow, well, this trend is even stronger. Now, I got a lot of uh, data, and we have uh, some questions to ask, so what I will do in this presentation is focus a bit on that. Uh, the first question is the adoption process. It's interesting to see in a market which is much more, more or less voluntary who makes this choice to take a, an energy certificate if it costs you 150 euros. We hold, heard also during the lunch that people feel that, 150 euros, and whether they will profit from it, well, they discount that. At which basis is this happening? So you would hope that this is on a massive scale, but is this the true, and how does that evolve over time, and why is that so? <coughs> If we're done with that, we're going to look at the effects of labels on the sale process. It's a little bit similar to what we just heard. We're going to look at, does it maybe affect the speed of the sale? Because you add some information to the process. You know a little bit more about the dwelling, which is for sale, than you did without the certificate. But also in pricing, are people willing to pay a bit more when the label is positive, green in this sense? And why would they do so? And there's one surprise act at the end. It's like the cliffhanger because I have a third question, but I not reveal it now to keep the suspense alive. <laughs> yeah, that's what I do. I always play with my audience a bit. Yeah. Well, here are the, the, the numbers. This is the table. The, the red bars indicate the, the downward slope of the number of transactions, and this is just, just the economy. So we had more in the beginning because the economy was better in January 2008 than it is now. But the blue line is more important. That is, you have to read that at the right axis. Starts about 20, 25%, and that is the market share of the certified dwellings versus non-certified of the total. So about one in four dwellings in the first quarter of 2008 were sold with an energy label. Three quarter was not. It was mandatory, but there was this waiver. But at the moment, we are at 7%. So let's say two months ago, 93% of people selling a home took, away the, took the waiver in. And there are many reasons for that. It's 150 euros, and I think everybody will think about that because they feel 150 euros also at economic downturns. But there was also a lot of bad media on the certificate. It turned out not to be very, very consistent, and definitions a bit vague, and the people who certified it were not very trained very well. So even our minister who was responsible that had to apologize for the poor quality, so that doesn't really help the case here. But there will be a new generation next month introduced with all kinds of improvements. But it's important to keep this in mind. Now, we know who took the label, who did not. And we have quite a big da data set. So this is a third of a table in the, in the paper. 
and to make it a little bit visible, I cut it up here. So these are five different models asking this, uh, answering the same question. It's a logic on who takes the label, who does not, and what are the distinctive differences in backgrounds. So I will show you what the difference is between the five different uh, columns later on. Uh, at the moment, you will see that, for instance, housing type is important. People with apartments are less likely uh, compared to, let's say, in this case, uh, row or detached homes as a reference group. You also see a period of transaction. As time progresses, we see fewer and fewer people just confirm statistically what we just saw in the graph. Um, things like size, I saw that already in the summer statistics. Smaller homes are less likely to take the energy labels. Period of construction, we see that Relatively old homes don't like to take, uh, or at least the owner don't like to take the energy certificate. But you also see at the bottom where the arrow stops that very relatively young homes don't take them either. The reason is that is by definition. The legislation says that if your home is younger than 10 years, you don't need to take the energy certificates just by, let's say, design, we find low representation there. But older homes, of course, have poor energy use, and that is also what people probably know. So they are, in a voluntary market, not taking the energy label at the moment. And a monument is a dummy saying that you have really an ancient home, and then people don't take the energy certificate to signal bad news. Now, the third part explains the difference between the five columns. We have a bunch of control variables also in quality and neighborhood and all kinds of stuff, and that is what we add here. So you can see that the differences between the different logic specifications. Um, only 26 minutes, so I'll take a, a few things. Maintenance er interior, that is important. Uh, the quality of the home in that sense uh, does drive a little bit this choice and this decision. Uh, insulation does not. Uh, so I didn't highlight that, but we all saw that before. On the neighborhood level, if you f find that it's low in density, uh, more, let's say, countryside areas, more likely to find these, uh, these energy labels. But also in neighborhoods where the average price is a little bit higher than average. So it's the posture neighborhoods also. And then voting green. Well, if people do vote green, at least in the neighborhood, we also find a positive uh, relationship, but also left, which is a little broader definition of green. And as these people also, let's say, walk the talk or talk the walk, at least they're consistent in their behavior and their opinions. So that's the first part. We see that these adoption process, we see the rates of an energy certificate you implemented in the market. If you do it voluntarily, we see a falling uh, rate over time, which is, which is a bit disappointing, of course, but very logical. We see that doing this, the decision is driven by things like dwelling type, what type of home. Apartments are a bit more standardized, and people are less inclined to take this signal because it doesn't really add information, apparently, compared to single dwelling, single family dwellings. Dwelling age, people know more or less probably also what that means, so they also consider that. Dwelling size, interior maintenance, location, low density, high values, but also ideals. It's not just a pragmatic choice as a tactical signal to the market that you have a good, good home for sale. But what is interesting is that it's not related to, uh, statistically to heating systems or insulation, but a lot of people think as well. Now, the effects of labels on the sale process, well, we had three things, and I only had 26 minutes, so I skipped the first. Speed of sale is not statistically driven <laughs> by, uh, by the certificate. Although you add information, we don't find any statistical proof if you control for all the other variables. At least if we do that, then we don't find any effect here. But on price, we do. A bit different than what the previous presenters did, but also what I think the difference is between us and them is that we really look at the signal. So whether you have a high or low energy bill is one thing, but if the next buyer knows that, is the other. So what we have is a certificate that only tells that. So this is communicating the energy status. Uh, and if you, of course, give the energy bill to the prospective buyer, then he or she would also maybe capitalize that in the market. What we find is a premium of around 2.5%. So having a green energy label, may, meaning class A, B, or C, compared to the rest, well, puts you in a better position. And people are willing to buy a higher price, controlling for a bunch of stuff. So the dotted things here mean it's not just a quality difference here. Everything is controlled for, including things like insulation and interior maintenance. And what is also interesting, if you look at uh, the far right, is that, yeah, there's something coming over there with the arrow. You also see that it, this premium moves with the outcome of the label. So G is here, the reference group, and you see that this premium is also moving along with it. 
We also do a stress test in time. We cut up our data set. We find uh, here in this case that this premium is always statistically significant, but it does weaken a bit. I mean, at the last period, we still find a 1.8% premium, which is not a little because we're talking about 230,000 euros. And if you take 2% of that, it's quite a nice amount. Um, but it is still there. So this is my cliffhanger almost. I have um, three more sheets, I believe. There's a third question that popped up, which we didn't have time, or at least we don't have the data yet to do it. We're going to look at the real energy usage. It's a bit like previous people have done this morning. Uh, gas, uh, which is very relevant because of the heating and 105 euros on average, and electricity bills of these individual dwellings of our sample of 100 and let's say 75,000 sales. So each individual bill we will get, we get it already from the Central Bureau of Statistics, and then we're going to look at what drives energy use. And we know, of course, of household demographics, but also of this, the specific things on the home. How strong is the link between A, B, C, G to what is really the energy bill? Is this consistent? It should be, of course. We're going to just, for the heck of it, test that. And then want to see whether this is also capitalized. If people indeed are paying now a premium for A, B, or C, well, is there also a fundament for that? Is the cash flow that people can expect from the bill every month, which is 20% of their mortgage every month, is this indeed related to that? So, uh, and perhaps maybe if people have this low energy bill, they are also inclined to take this, 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 um, this, this label in the end. So this opens up uh, a new uh, uh, well, a street of extra data, but we will do that in a week or two. I was hoping to do that now, but given the 26 minutes also better, I didn't do it yet. I've got some uh, statistics to give you an idea about what we do with energy, but we have the summary statistics already. <coughs> On central heating, it's 73% of the gas bill, which is the, the significant part here. Cooking on, on gas and hot water is only, let's say, together 25, 27%. So heating the home is really a very important stuff. Uh, so the energy bill and everything that you can do to improve the uh, status there will make a big difference in a market like this. If you look at the categories A to G, there are statistics that show, I mean, the electric electricity bill in, in the Netherlands is relatively flat, not related to the energy performance certificate, because we don't have this air conditioning. But the gas bill, the red bars, are very different. So this is a standardized home, the average mean home in the Netherlands. The average bill will be a D label, which is about 110 euros, 105 euros, but this can range between 170 and 50. That's quite a big range. So we think that if we can do this on an individual basis and then find whether this really matters for the price, we can make people more aware of this. Which brings me to my conclusions. So we find that energy labels are adopted slow in the Netherlands, 25% at the beginning, but at the moment it's only 7 And many reasons for that. And they are adopted mostly by high-end owners in relatively young homes in competitive markets. Um, but they are also people who are voting or more likely to vote green. So it's not just pragmatics and it's tacticals, but it's also some ideal. We also find that energy labels um, affect, well, not the speed of sale, because we're expecting that to some extent, but we can't confirm that hypothesis. But we do find a premium. And the premium at the moment, in the worst case, if we really control for everything, is 2.45%, but very significant. So that's about 6,000 euros. Also, when controlling for quality. A lot of people wonder about that, but we can control it. This is not just a spurious regression result. And the last thing is uh, the link to energy, the real use. And that's what we will be doing uh, as soon as I get back. That's my email address. I don't really know why, but uh, you can also ask me questions. OK. Okay, we have uh, two discussants for this afternoon's session, and our first is uh, Matt Turner from the University of Toronto. Matt? Uh, thank you. So, uh, so uh, the current government in Canada, uh, their power base is in Alberta, where the principal economic output derives from tar sands. So we're not actually having a debate over energy conservation and building standards. Um, we're, uh, so it was, uh, and I haven't been following the Waxman bill that closely, so I'm really excited to be here and get a chance to learn about this stuff. Um, having said that, I was, uh, uh, so thanks to the organizers for inviting me. 
Um, I, I was actually one of the two people who mentioned to Max this morning that I'd like to hear a little bit more about taxes. Um, so let me, let me try to, uh, what we've been talking about a lot over the last two days is the effects of two policy interventions which are intended to reduce building, in for, uh, building energy consumption. The first is a labeling program and the second are building standards which are distinct. All right? I think we should, should bear that in mind because they're going to have different effects. Catherine yesterday mentioned energy taxes. Right? We've been discussing ways to make standards better, to make labels better. I think that we might want to, uh, I, I would frame it a little bit differently. We have a lot of experience with the way people respond to changes in taxes and prices. Um, I think that the, the sulfur oxide trading program that runs out of the Chicago Board of Trade is a really good example of that. We also have a lot of experience with mandated standards. Right? I think CAFE is a nice example of that. The CAFE standards um, have led to, uh, you, you see over the last 20 years that the uh, Fuel economy, corporate average fuel economy is constant while horsepower is doubled. Right, it's hard to imagine that happening under a tax. So we have a lot of experience with tax programs and with, with command and control programs. And I, I think that, that while we don't know a lot about building codes necessarily or green certification programs, uh, we have a lot of experience of, of these instruments in other environments, and I think that that experience suggests that our prior should be that we want to use taxes to energy taxes to accomplish building reductions. So I, I, I think that the way I'd like to frame these two papers is as providing a framework that we can use to assess whether there's a case to be made for using green, uh, green certification or um, or building codes in place of taxes. All right, I think that should be the test. I think that we should be thinking about these, uh, trying to build a case for building codes as an alternative to taxes rather than necessarily thinking about refinements to different building codes. All right. So with that said, all right, if we want to, uh, I, I want to view these papers as, as laying down the framework the, the, the foundations for, for making that assessment. Should we prefer, is there, can we make a case for preferring um, building codes or certification to, to an energy tax, right? First sort of general point. Um, the second general point is, is I think that the design, uh, this is, and this is particular certification programs, I think that the design of certification programs, getting these things right, depends crucially on the way that we think they operate in the market, all right? And we've heard a couple of stories around that. All right, we've heard about certification programs, or sort of the panels yesterday talked about this. Uh, we've heard about certification programs working to resolve principal agent problems, so conveying information from landlords to tenants, and we've heard about them serving as uh, providing information to owners so that they can, can adjust their technology. All right? And I think that we really want to think about how they act. Um, imagine that the principal, so it, if the principal function of, of certification programs is to um, convey information to consumers about the quality of the building, then you might want different information in those labels than if you're trying to convey information to investors who only care about the, the cost of operating the building. All right, so imagine that, that after getting off an airplane to fly here, you're feeling guilty about your carbon footprint and are looking forward to checking into a low carbon hotel. All right. In that case, a hotel that ran entirely on solar would be really attractive, and I would want a label which indicated that. On the other hand, if I were an investor flying here to buy a hotel, that might be one I would shy away from. All right. So unless we know the function, think carefully about the function of these things, uh, I think it's going to be hard to get them designed optimally. It seems to me that we don't yet have a careful enumeration of the possible functions of these certification programs, and that both of the papers that we've seen today are are particularly the second one, are handicapped by that because it's hard to know what you want to test. How do we test what these things are doing? We don't know exactly what we want them to do. All right. It's general comments. All right. Now, on Matt's, uh, Matt and Dora's very nice paper. Um, so they have household and, in, so they have house and, and house and individual match data. They're matching people to households for all of Sacramento for eight years, plus a whole bunch of other stuff. That's just awesome, right? Um, <laughs> um, um, so um, 
they're using this data to study the relationship between energy demand, household dem and a whole bunch of other stuff. Household demographics, um, appliances, the efficiency, uh, sort of efficiency retrofits, the vintage of the house, and the share of green voting neighbors. All right, I, I, they're, they're getting at really important issues which are, which are obviously relevant to the things that we're talking about and to assessing these, the, the, the building codes that, that we're interested in. All right. I have a couple of points about this, uh, a, a couple of comments about the paper. First is a, a comment about California exceptionality and um, the, the Rosenfeld puzzle. And I, and I want to be careful because I think yesterday when Professor Rosenfeld or Commissioner Rosenfeld presented this stuff, he was very careful to be modest about his claim for the extent of California's exceptionality. Uh, I think that that's appropriate and this graph uh, will, I think, help to illustrate why. I think a lot of the California exceptionality does not reflect California exceptionality. I think it reflects the fact that people are moving around, right? So what this is, is, is uh, uh, what's happening is people are moving from Buffalo to Phoenix. When they do that, they move into bigger houses and burn more air conditioning, all right? So what this graph is, is for, uh, I used urbanized counties in the US because it's what I could do quickly. For all counties in the US, what I'm counting is per capita per capita exposure to heating degree days, cooling degree days, all right, over uh, using census data. And I have two different, two different census time series. All right, and what you see is there's this huge run up in per capita exposure to cooling degree days. All right, so people are moving from Buffalo to, uh, to, uh, to, to Phoenix and running the air conditioners more. So a lot of the, the gap, that's this, this, this divergence between California and the rest, of the, the rest of the country reflects this migration, all right? In addition, we know that people are moving into newer houses, which are larger, all right? Bigger houses are harder to cool just because by virtue of being bigger. We also know, all right, that people who move are not random, right? The people who move are not necessarily like the people who don't move. All right, so there's now uh, a developing literature which shows that people who move to big cities tend to be more productive than people who don't move to big cities. All right, in my, mo my own work, I found that people who uh, move to sprawling places have different propensities to gain weight than people who don't. All right, we don't, we don't want to think about people moving at random. All right, so in addition to this big migration going on, we worry that the people who move are different than the people that don't. All of those things, I, I think, are going to work against the California exceptionality. So I'm uncomfortable having them motivate their paper with this claim because I suspect it's not quite as big as, it, as, as, as it's represented to be. The second thing is um, they have data for California, and they want to present, so, so, so the, the First, we have California's exceptional, and then we have data for Sacramento, which is representative. And I think that the two things are working against each other, and you want to pick one. And I would pick that Sacramento is representative and run with that. Um, the third thing is by motivating this paper this way, right, what you're saying is there's a divergence between California and the rest of the country in 1978. Right? Um, we can point to anything that happened in 1978. Um, and attribute the divergence to, to that. And this, this is, that's a pretty risky form of inference, and, and I, I, I think we want to be careful about that. So that's it on motivation. Um, I have a couple of uh, sort of minor econometric issues that I would like to see uh, the paper deal with more completely. Um, the first is, is that, as, as, the, as, the, as Matt and Dora clearly understand, these electricity consumption estimates you have uh, the, the estimating equations are household consumption of electricity as a function of stuff, all right, um, sometimes including price. Those are equilibrium equations, not demand equations, all right? Um, now, there's a couple of issues. First, I, uh, it would be helpful to interpret, that's a standard problem. Um, we know how to deal with that. I think that in this case, I think that they can fix this. I think that the supply curve is observable here. Right, I think that SMUD is a regulated utility. You can go find out what supply schedule everybody faced. So if you write down the supply equation and you write down, uh, and it doesn't change over the course of the year. So if you write down the supply equation, you write down the demand equation, I think you can completely resolve that simultaneity problem if you want to. All right, it seems like that would be something that would be worth pursuing. Um, 
The second thing is that I'm not totally sure whether you want to estimate an equilibrium relationship or if you want a demand relationship. Maybe you actually want an equilibrium relationship. You want to think about the equilibrium change in energy demand that results from, uh, from, uh, from policy changes or not. I, I'm, uh, so, so those are two things which I'd like to see cleared up a little bit more. The third thing, second thing, um, <laughs> um, I'm worried about correlation between unobserved house characteristics and unobserved resident characteristics. All right, so here's an example of how this could get you, have you go, how, how you could go awry with this. Suppose that we have two individuals, both of whom have two years of college and are, other, and are observably identical. One of those two people um, has two years of community college, all right? The other dropped out of Berkeley after two years to start a dot com. Okay, we expect that one of those people will live in a house with an old furnace and not use it very much. One of those people will live in a house with a new furnace and use it as much as they want, or air conditioner. Right? That kind of sorting is going to bias your estimates of the effect of air conditioners. All right? um, now, the thing that's really neat about this data is I think that they can fix that. Okay? They have household data. They're tracking houses. They're tracking people. You ought to be able to put in individual fixed effects. Where are, where are Matt and Dora? Can you guys put in individual fixed effects? We can, and we did in the panel, but we don't see the demographics. We only see the demographics once. So, so, so go on with your thoughts. So if, if you can track people as they move from one house to another, then you can have an individual fixed effect and get variation in household characteristics, which would let you pull out the individual fixed effect, and just, which I think solves that problem, lets you deal with the problem of sorting and matching of people with particular characteristics to particular types of, uh, of houses. All right. Um, my last and third, my third and last point, um, which is not on this page. Um, it's clear this is really neat data. I think you're going after really important stuff. As I think other people have told you before, it seems to me that you have too much stuff uh, for one paper. Um, I think that the results about the FLEX program are fascinating, uh, the, uh, sort of in line with the, the stuff about smiley face. Uh, I've seen a co uh, at least one other paper on the role of moral suasion in, in moving people or moving people's utility bills around. Um, the FLEX program seems like something's really interesting to look at as part of that literature. I'd like to see you break that out and look at, look at whether the FLEX program affects different people differently, um, look at whether, sort of break it out sort of in more detail. I think that would stand by itself. The second thing I think is really interesting is we've talked a lot today about the durability of housing, right, but not very much about the remodeling of housing. And here, they're tracking houses over long periods of time, and we could think about um, the, the, the process by which people, uh, by which people renovate their houses. Right? Um, it, and I have in mind John, something along the lines of John Ross' study of bus engines. And it's not clear to me if you have enough data to do that, but since we're really concerned about the durability of this stuff, we ought to be really concerned about updating it too. And I think you might have the data to get at that, and that also would surely stand by itself. Uh, finally, the stuff about vintage, uh, the vintage of the house being really important, uh, reminds me of an old paper by Mieskowski and Smith and RSUE, which looks at uh, the nature of building permits uh, in Houston as a function of the year they were filed and finds a result similar to yours, which is that contemporaneous conditions are really important. And, and I think you probably should, should try to track that paper down. All right, next one. Okay, so the, the, um, the, the second paper also has a very interesting data set. It's tracking housing transactions. How long do I have? I forgot to stop my watch. All right. Um, uh, they have a long sample of real estate transactions, uh, some of which are for houses with environmental certificate and some without. Conditional on the house having an energy label, we know its score, whether it's an efficient house or not, and um, we think that the score on this, this test should be related to its energy efficiency. The main finding of the paper is that houses with a certificate are selling for about 2.5% more than houses that are not. That's on the order of 5,000 euros. Right? Um, 
and more energy houses which have a certificate and have higher scores on the certificate sell for more than houses with a certificate with a lower score. Right? One interpretation of these results is that if you get a certificate for your house, you create value. You add 2.5% to the value of your house. Right? We know that markets may, so, so we should be clear here. Here, the role, I think, in this study, what the authors envision is the role for certificates here is to convey information from the buyer to the seller. All right? We're trying to resolve a principal agent problem. Right? We know from Stiglitz, uh, Spence, and, and um, Stiglitz and Spence that, that you can have markets fail to work properly when there's asymmetric information like this. And we want to conceive of, of, of the, the, the certificate as conveying information to resolve this market failure, I think. All right? um, and I think that the result that they're finding is, is sort of just within the realm of theoretical possibility. All right? Having said that, I think that this problem of inferring the price effect of green labels is a really, really hard problem. Um, and I am concerned about their findings for, for a number of reasons, which let me, let me lay them out. The first is, is that when this program was rolled out, 20% of the people started it. Within two years, only 7% of the people were doing it. Okay? Um, what that tells me is that after two years of experience, 93% of transactions, of the parties to the transactions, thought these certificates were worth less than 150 euros. Okay? Right? That's difficult to reconcile with the regression results, which show that the certificates are creating value on the order of 5,000 euros. All right? Second, all right, and if I could get my second slide, and zoom way in on the top of it. There, right there. All right, that's perfect. Okay, so this is, this is the table of regressions which shows, which shows the price effect, the effect of, a label, of energy labels on price. And in the first three columns, what we're doing is we're looking, we're comparing houses with energy labels to houses without. And you see that there's about a 2.5% effect. Okay, in the fourth column, we're doing the same exercise, but we're looking at different scores. Right? Now, F is the worst possible energy label score that you can get. If you look at the coefficient on F there and compare it with the coefficient for having an energy label, you'll see they're about the same. Oh, sorry. You'll see that they're about the same, which says that the return from having an energy label is, on average, is just about equal to the return from getting an energy label and getting the worst score. All right? The omitted one is the last one. Oh, the omitted one is the last one? Oh, okay. Oh, second worst. Oh, I didn't understand that. Oh, I didn't understand that. I was about to suggest that you have an omitted, very omitted category in there. So forget that. That last bit's off, all right? Well, the first three columns don't compare to not labeled dwellings, but labeled dwellings with a non green label. So the 2.5% sort of came into not being labeled, but being labeled but not green. Ah, okay. So forget all that. <laughs> forget all that. Um, second, um, you, you, at the end you said you were going to put in, um, you were going to put in uh, utility bills. I really would like, I think that's a really interesting thing to do. Sorry, that you're getting energy expenditure. I think it's a really interesting thing to do. Here's why. I think that when I walk into a house, um, I can tell a lot about its energy efficiency. I can look and see if the windows are new. I can look at the efficiency of the furnace. I can feel if it's drafty, okay? I question then how much information is conveyed to me by the certificate, all right? Um, the fact that, that, that there is, in fact, whether I'm able, in fact, to forecast energy consumption better from what I see looking around the house or from the energy certificate, it's not at all clear to me that I could do that. I have an energy certificate in my house, and I don't actually find it very informative, right? Um, so, so that's consistent with the information not being valuable, and since it doesn't change people's value of the transaction, which is consistent with 93% of the people not wanting it, right? Um, the second, the, 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 the last thing that I'm worried about is I'm worried that energy efficiency is correlated with overall unobserved quality. Right? And that's a very hard problem to crack. Right? For example, this building is very energy efficient. This lecture hall, this building is very energy efficient and it is much more energy efficient than the lecture halls I'm usually in. It's also much nicer. 
all right? Uh, I think that it's likely that in general those two things are correlated. So when you look at energy efficiency, it's likely to be correlated with unobserved quality um, and that that's going to be a real problem to confound your estimates. I think something you might consider is using last sale price, right? Doing repeat sales and that might help you get at that. Anyways, I think this is really important stuff, really hard problems, and I want to encourage everybody to keep working on it uh, because it's coming down the pike and we need to figure it out one way or the other. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, our, our second discussant is Chris Knettel from uh, UC Davis. Chris? Great. Well, um, again, as, as Matt did, I think the organizers were inviting me here. These are two great papers uh, two, on, two, on very interesting topics and very important. And uh, I come back to this slide from uh, yesterday that Art put up um, to underline the importance of, of these papers. So if you look, this again, this is a supply curve of, of carbon uh, reductions. Um, <laughs> unlike many supply curves that economists look, uh, tend to look at, there's, there's a negative space here. Um, and if we circle all of uh, the negative numbers that these papers either directly or indirectly deal with, um, we, get, we get a large fraction of it. Um, so understanding um, what's going on with why, why there's, whether there actually is a negative uh, portion of the supply curve and, and if so, why it exists um, is, is very important. And uh, yesterday we brought up a lot of reasons why uh, the negative portion of the supply curve might exist, uh, either principal agent issues, information asymmetries, um, et cetera, et cetera. But we, as economists, I think uh, everyone in here can also come up with reasons why it, it doesn't exist. Um, you know, some set of costs that were ignored when constructing these, um, some disconnect between the engineering estimates um, and the real world um, um, outcomes of something like building standards. So any, anything that we can do to add to our understanding of whether this, this is actually negative costs um, um, or not, I think is, is very important. And these, these papers uh, both directly and indirectly do this. Um, again, you know, Max stole my, my analogy of that, that this is $250 bills uh, laying on the floor. Um, well, actually, Max, I'd like to discourage you from going into the counterfeiting business. There, there aren't such thing. Um, I don't want you producing $250 bills or anything. Um, but Art actually used the analogy that this is low-hanging fruit. And I'd actually say this isn't low-hanging fruit. This is fruit that's already been picked and walked over to your house. Um, so again, if, if, this, if this is the actual supply curve, uh, then meeting goals at, at 20, in 2050 or meeting 2020 goals are going to be pretty, pretty costless. Um, if not pr uh, actually productive. Um, so my bottom line on these two papers is that they're, they're both very interesting. They both bring very, very interesting data uh, that will, I think, in, in the future um, spawn ver a, a number of additional papers. Um, and all of my comments are actually going to be the, of the I want more variety. Um, so let me just uh, dive into those. So uh, first, the green level labels paper. Um, I'll just briefly summarize what it does. It, it exploits uh, the fact that since, since January 2008, every, and I put every in quotes, because for the first few days that I was reading this paper, I was actually thinking it was every, but it's not actually every uh, transaction requires a permit or a, a certificate. Um, and these certificates range from a G, which means you're a, a gross polluter, to an A triple plus. Um, some, some houses are uh, exempt uh, automatically. These are anything built after 1999 and, and any uh, monument. Uh, but the big issue, uh, one of the issues with the paper, and I, and I would expect that the authors would have liked this policy to be mandatory, uh, but it's not. Um, so you can get a waiver. And in fact, um, over 70 or over 80% of the transactions get that waiver. Um, but nonetheless, they have transaction-level data and a, a number of interesting property characteristics. And one of the things, one of the sh shortcomings, in, and I encourage them to try to get these data, is they only have data post-policy. Post um, for a number of reasons, it would be great if you can get transaction-level data before the policy, uh, either matching houses like Matt suggested um, or, you know, or even um, housing fixed effects. And, and, I'll, and I'll get into why that might be interesting. Um, the analysis that they do is uh, what drives whether you get a certificate. 
how long the house uh, stays on the market and the transaction price. Um, so the first, the first set of analysis is a probability model as a function of getting, getting a, or having a certificate. Um, and having a certificate means one of two things. One is that you were, you were quote unquote required to have a certificate and you didn't get a waiver. Or you weren't required, but you chose to get a certificate anyways. Um, I don't know how many fall in that former category, but, but those are two very different decisions, uh, given what we know about framing and benchmarking. Um, one thing you, you might think about is disentangling those, those two decisions and seeing whether uh, different, you have different drivers for those. Also, as an I.O. person, uh, when, when I heard mandatory and I heard um, a, a class of people that were exempt, I thought, oh, this is a perfect perfect setting for unraveling in the sense that you require a permit, I'm, I don't require a certificate, but if I don't get one, then somebody who's going to buy my house thinks that I'm a dirty house, so I, I'm going to get, if I'm above average, I'm going to get it, but now everyone that above, is above average gets it, so that changes the average, so in the end, the equilibrium is everyone gets a certificate. Um, so, you know, maybe you, you can convince the, the actual Policymakers to make it mandatory and, and study this. Um, but now that I, once I realized that it wasn't quite um, mandatory, I thought of some other IO topic, which is uh, something like peer effects. What happens if uh, houses in your neighborhood um, are more likely to get certificates or have got certificates in the past? Are you more likely to get a, a certificate and so on? Um, in terms of the time on the market and the price regression, so they, they didn't show the time on the market uh, regressions, um, but I'm, I'm going to have a comment on those anyways. Um, the nice thing about it is they have a, a full set of, uh, a very rich set of controls. They could, um, they know the score, they know when the house was built. If it's the price regression, they include time on the, on the market. I'm not a real estate guy, but obviously that's endogenous, um, so I don't know if I'd want to include that. Uh, they have housing type dummies, whether it's new construction and so on and so forth. Um, you don't account for selection, and I think that's, you know, obviously the, the houses that got, have the certificate chose to do so. You might want to think about ways to do that. Maybe some exogenous shifters that might, might um, allow you to instrument for that. Um, to be, and to be clear, they have vintage fixed effects, so they, they know they include dummy variables for when the house was built. So the variation that they're exploiting in these regressions is that they're essentially comparing a house that was built in, in the 1980s, uh, a detached house in the 1980s that's an A with a detached house in the 1980s that's a G, the omitted category. Um, and and un realizing that is, is important for, for thinking about how we interpret these results. Um, the time on the market results, so they actually do find a time on the market effect uh, when they include all homes, those that didn't have certificates and those that didn't, but when they restrict the sample to only certificated homes, that goes away, and I, I wasn't quite sure why, um, and I, I would encourage you to think about why and think about um, some possible explanations. Um, nonetheless, the price results, I think, are the most interesting. Uh, so they find an A home sells, on average, for 12% uh, more than a G home, um, which is huge, I would say. So if we believe, so let's, let's take these for granted for a second. I'm going to think about reasons why they might be biased. But if we believe that was 12%, I'd like you to push on that result a little more. Like, what's the cost of moving a G home to an A home? Would it actually make sense for me to do so? either at the time of being built or, or re renovations. Um, and if you can get the pre-law data, the one, if, if we're going to think of this as information asymmetries, then what I really want to know is what an A home sold for before the law versus now. And the value of the certification process is that difference. Um, so knowing the change, the change in the, the, ha the sale price of an A home because of the certification program is what you really want to know for understanding whether uh, the, these markets are actually driven by information asymmetries. Um, why might we think that that coefficient might be biased? So again, I go back to what the variation is, is and I'm comparing a detached 1980s home that's an A rating with the G detached 1980s home that's a G rating. I, I want to know why one's an A and one's a G, right? Uh, in the US, if they were all built under the same building code or, or standards, then the reason why the A home is an A home is because it was recently renovated and it's now under tighter 
tighter standards. And if it's recently renovated, then it's probably not just inter energy efficiency that's, that's different. Um, it might have an updated kitchen, it might have an updated uh, floor plan, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, so I think that's the biggest kind of barrier that, that you face to, to really convincing me that, that it's all about inter, uh, energy efficiency and not about some unobservable. Um, now you do have controls, so when you throw, the, throw in those controls that value falls, which is suggestive that there is something that's unobservable and it's not just randomly distributed across, across homes, the, then the question becomes, are your controls enough? And one of the, my worries about your controls is they actually enter in with the wrong sign. So your good interior and good exterior have negative coefficients. Um, so I just start to wonder um, whether or not um, those, those are suitable controls. If you had pre-law data, then you could, comp you could at least have house fixed effects, look at what that same house sold for before the law, and what it did after the law. You might think something changed in, that in, in the meantime, but, but at least that gets you really far in, in terms of uh, convincing, convincing the reader. Um, okay, so on to the, the second paper uh, by Dora and Matt. Um, so again, great data. Uh, they have seven different data sets. They have pages upon pages of, um, of tables. Um, and actually, similar to, to what Matt was saying, one of my comments is going to be that this is, this is definitely more than one paper. You just, uh, any one topic, you don't do, do enough justice because you, you can't spend enough time on in, 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 the, uh, in, the, in the allotted space. Um, so they look at how construction vintage is associated with usage, uh, whether the, this is one of the fa more fascinating things, whether the price of electricity at the time of construction is correlated with usage, uh, neighbor, neighborhood effects, uh, ideology effects. Another very interesting one is this flex, flex your power campaign. Um, and then things like how the sales price is correlated with, with solar panels. And then decomposing the Rosenfeld effect or Rosenfeld curve. Um, so I won't, I won't even try to summarize uh, the results. There's many of them. They're all very interesting. Uh, my first question, though, is, is whether I'm viewing this paper as a, as a as a great paper with a bunch of very interesting correlations, or whether I'm viewing this, all these uh, tables as, as treatment effects. At one point you, in the paper, you use the word treatment effect. If they're really treatment effects, then I think one of the most effective ways of reducing electricity usage is to teach everyone Spanish, because um, your Spanish dummy variable comes in negative and significant and, and pretty big. Um, now, that might actually be the case. I, you know, I, I'm a frequent uh, watcher of uh, Gigante Sabato, I think it is. Um, and I know if that's the only thing I could watch, I'd probably watch a lot, lot less uh, TV. Um, but, but we might also think that, th think that that's proxying for, for something else. The other thing is, you know, the first thing you might want to do is ban Fox News um, and force everyone to watch MSNBC or, or vice versa, because I know I become more liberal when I watch Fox News. Um, um, <laughs> Um, so the, the one thing, if, if you want to view these as treatment effects, then I think you could do more to convince us that the, the econometric results are in line with, with what we would expect, expect them to be um, using either engineering, using engineering estimates. For example, on the right-hand side, you have things like, does the house have a large plasma TV? Does it have one small LCD, two or more, and so on and so forth? So it, you could use those. You could look at the average electricity usage of a large plasma TV, the average time it's on. And, then com and, and if your coefficient's a lot bigger than the electricity use from that, then, then that's, that's cause of concern that, that this is proxying for something, something else. Um, the other thing you can do is, and you do this uh, some ways, is, is you could compare your PV results and ask whether those are too big. So you find, on average, that a house with the PV system sells for about 24000 extra dollars. Um, I think the cost, tax, tax rebates included, is probably less than 24000 um, So that suggests that maybe, maybe that's proxying for not only the PV system, but, but something else. Um, but, but I think you can push, push on that um, quite a bit more. 
The other thing, and, and I think Matt, Matt also said this, is, is the media stuff, I think, is its own paper. I think that's fascinating. I think you can do a lot more if you had 40 pages uh, uh, devoted just to that to convince us that this is actually there. You basically have uh, something very similar to a regression discontinuity design um, in the sense that it's on and then it's off and then it's on again. So the first, the first step in doing this convincingly is show me the pictures, right? So if, if, if the regressions are actually, uh, are actually true, then if you just plotted the time series of either average consumption or, or a scatter plot of household level consumptions and some non-parametric uh, lines in, or uh, curves, then, then it would go a long way in convincing us that this is, this is actually uh, causal. Um, the other thing is, is if once you convince me that it's causal, how much did it cost? So is, was the Fletcher Power campaign actually cost effective and should we be doing more of that? Um, and then just one more slide on some nitpicking comments. So again, the, Ro the Rosenfeld effect might also be its own paper. I, I think um, you, know, you spent two pages on it and I really wanted a lot more. You could discuss the econometric issues that, that arise. One of the things is if you're going to do this well, then you have to think about what should be on the right-hand side because a lot of the right-hand side variables are correlated with each other, but you don't have data back in the 70s, like hybrid. You know, the, for example, the hybrid effect um, you might not want to include that because, because that's grabbing some of the liberal effect. That if you were to take the hybrid uh, variable out of there, the, the liberal coefficient, I bet, would go up. Um, and you might want to do counterfactuals with the, with the liberal coefficient, but you might feel uncomfortable doing so with the hybrid coefficient since hybrids didn't exist back in the 70s. <laughs> Um, the last comment is in, in functional forms. Economists or econometricians usually migrate to log on log because we like percentages, but a lot of your right-hand side variables aren't percentage effects. Uh, we could actually, we could almost think that they're level effects. You know, if I give you a plasma TV, you might think that somebody in a bigger house that consumes more electricity is going to watch it more, so that's consistent with the percentage effect, but unless that's the case, then it's just a level effect, and, and solar panels uh, one can make the same argument. Um, so you might want to try at least nonlinearity terms in, in the regressions. Um, so to summarize, two very interesting papers, awesome data, um, and for both of them, I'd like them to push the results um, a bit more. That's it. So John, we're a little bit over. Do you, is it okay if we have a few minutes of discussion? So. Um, First of all, maybe I'll ask Dirk and, uh, and Dora and Matt maybe to come up for just a minute. And uh, Dirk, since you're the sh closest one to the podium, are there any things you'd like to say in response to the discussions? Yeah, please. Uh, well, yeah, I would like to thank uh, the, uh, the discussions. It was well worth uh, flying 11 hours, and I'm not sure how much carbon in footprint that was, but these were really great, uh, great comments. Thank you. Folks, thank you very much. We want to collect more comments. That was very useful. Okay, well, that was short and sweet. Uh, any comments from the audience? Anybody want to? Please. I've got a couple of comments on, on Matt and Dora's paper. The first one is on the, on the flexor power stuff. Um, you, you misspoke when you said that the outages were in the summer of 2000 that essentially all, with one exception, the outages were in the winter of 2001 in March. Mm -hmm. So you, you're talking about a period that overlaps the outage and a whole lot of other information was descending on consumers besides the Flexure Power campaign. So I think you have a real problem with identifying with just the, the Flexure Power. The second piece is, it has to do with the um, use of the, of the the survey data on uh, appliance holdings. And, and I don't know the exact survey you're working with, but I've worked with those surveys in the past, and they suffer notoriously from uh, non-response. And uh, I'm not sure what you've done about non-response, but you need to give attention to it uh, because the response rates are running... 20%. They, they're low. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? Bubble with the CPUC. Um, is this on? Um, I was interested. I, I, I wasn't able to read the the 
the base papers, just on the presentations. I was interested in the finding that most renovations increase electricity use, and the slide was up there pretty quickly, so I couldn't catch it all. Um, but I was wondering if you looked specifically at, um, in that, the efficiency component of those renovations, or just that a renovation occurred, or did your data show that the, you know, renovations included more efficient equipment, included participating in utility programs, that kind of thing? No, all we know is what is in the permit data. Okay. Dollar amount. So okay. dollar amount and a brief description, which varies depending how detailed okay. the contractor decided to be. Okay. We wonder if the household were spending more time at home as the house's quality improves. Right. And, and so the, the, there's the durables and there's the utilization offsetting each other. Yeah. And the house gets, yeah, our square yeah. footage was small though, uh, the, the square footage effect. Yeah, but it, yeah. Did, it increased electricity consumption as you'd expect, I, so. Yeah, and I just, I guess hopefully, well maybe you've heard there's a lot of these uh, comprehensive whole house retrofit programs starting up um, in many states, including in California hopefully soon and being pushed federally. So there's, there's some initial data, I think, coming out of some of those programs. So yeah. I, I think that's an important point. From a public policy perspective, I think our results show that past renovations, th there's a role for the energy companies to get involved with households who put in a renovation permit to consider greener stuff. Right. And SMUD, that's one thing we've been talking to SMUD about. Right. You, I guess... You, it might be interesting to look at some of the emerging data from some of those other studies and compare it to some of the renovation data that you, you have and just see if there's anything interesting. Great. Thank you. Uh, Lucas? Yeah, just a very quick question for Dirk and Niels. Uh, could, you, could you talk for a couple of minutes about the second phase of the new certificates that you mentioned are coming out? What are, they gonna, are they going to be mandatory? What are they going to look like? Same format? Is it going to still be an unconditional uh, measure? A good question. Is there a chance you. to, uh, you know, <laughs> maybe be involved in what those certificates are going to look like? So they're going to be a bit more informative. So besides the A to G, there's going to be actual information on modeled energy consumption. So they're not still not based on, on kind of in-use energy consumption of the building. And uh, the Dutch uh, politics are not strong enough actually to, uh, to get this mandatory. So they're still going to be, well, mandatory as they are now. Uh, in other member states, however, the labels are mandatory. So Holland is one of the few where there's kind of this, this opting out possibility. But there are some, some things that might be uh, coming our way. Also, the, our Minister of uh, Economic Affairs sent a letter out uh, that they, she, would, she will raise our energy bill with another, let's say, 100 to 200 euros a year to uh, take that tax receipt into durable energy resource investments and also to uh, uh, spike less awareness about what you're using. Uh, so they use, there are some tax uh, things coming our way, and what you also will see in, in the UK, at least in the commercial real estate market, that the result of the energy label will also determine how much local taxes you will be paying. It's not at the moment in, in January coming our way, but it, it is evolving in that path a bit. Yeah. Oh, please. So this is just some advice to Chris. Uh, you better collect more data uh, because it's probably going to change that the liberal Prius drivers probably be the largest consumers of electricity in the next few years. <laughs> and, and so with the, Smut has been interested in this stuff for where the plug-in hybrid, where there could be hot spots in their system. And so, they, so yeah. they've had this on the brain. So it's, it's good that you collected now because you have a set sample, then you can see how everything varies in the next 10 years. And, and this is the reason they first got in touch with me, because yeah. uh, they'd seen my Prius stuff and thought that was a leading indicator of where the plug-in hybrids will be centered. Yeah, because the, it's estimated that actually it's about double the, the amount of consumer uh, electricity use will be from these hybrid electric vehicles. Just a few more. I have a, a question for Dora, Matt, and Matt. Um, when Matt started on his comment on, on Dora and Matt's paper um, about mobility, where I thought you were going to go with that, what was going to have something to do with the fact that perhaps in California when people are moving, they're moving into smaller houses because of land constraints as opposed to the rest of the country where housing footprints have been expanding. And um, so the first part of my question is, is this something that someone's looked at? Is, is that part of the puzzle? And, and my second question, um, 
relates directly to this notion of, of moving, and we're moving to parts of the country that have larger, you know, larger houses. Um, it seems, should be really directly, you know, we should be easy to com compute whether or not this is a composition effect. And so the question I had was when we look at these graphs, right, is it, are we looking at comparing California to the average across the U.S., or are we looking at comparing uh, California to the average sort of of state averages? In, in other words, what is that? When I look at that curve, what is the, 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 the non-California sort of counterfactual, as it were? Is it the average across the entire U.S., or is it an average of state levels? And so would you see, Matt, in that, when you did that, average, if you were to look at a single state average or an average of state averages, you, you wouldn't see the effect that Matt is saying because the, you know, that, that composition, recomposition effect would get lost. And so I'm curious if that's been done. Yeah, Max did it this morning. Uh, he Max? had, Max had some per capita energy consumption right. graphs for states this morning, and most of them were flat. They're flat, yeah. But, but in the case of California, think of the growth of Riverside and San Bernardino. So we're growing in hot counties. Uh, the state's moving south into sprawl cheap areas. And so taking the, disaggregating where the population's going might actually lead to California having a bigger footprint if you took the migration into account within state. Great. Just, just a couple more questions quickly, please. Okay. Uh, Randall Bowie, Rockwell International. A question from Niels and uh, Dirk. Uh, as I may have made clear at the launch of the discussion, I was quite involved and, in fact, was the, uh, in the Com European Commission responsible for this EPVD directive. So it's encouraging to see that the certification does give significance on the, for the higher, for the A-level buildings. However, having said that, I'm a bit concerned about these waivers that you seem to be, uh, the fact that uh, you're down to seven, if I understood it correctly, seven percent. Uh, I support, you know, your, what you're doing very much, but uh, the Netherlands, uh, are you sure that uh, these waivers are not in violation of the, uh, of the intention of this directive? They may be. Uh, everything is possible in the Netherlands. <laughs> That, that really, was, everything. That was the right answer. Thank you. No, but I, seriously, I, I think uh, that may also be introducing problems in your statistics. I, I'm, a little, I'm a bit worried about that. Of course, I encourage, you know, having worked with this directive and still working with it in, a, in private industry, I like to see it give effect. And I hope that this, your statistics hold up under <laughs> scrutiny. But I do worry about this, the fact that you're down to 7% now for two reasons, legal reasons within the, uh, the legal process, if the, if the Netherlands is in violation, but also if, it, if it's not creating problems in your statistics, it, you're getting a bias there. Uh, have you corrected for that, the fact that those who have houses with good, that they know they can sell, are the ones who are making sure they get certified. Yeah, uh, though, of course we thought of that, but if you're looking at the distribution of those uh, energy labels, we don't see very clear indications for this. And I do think it's also what Matthew told as the first discussion, that it is designed to convey information from the, from the owner to the, to the buyer, and it's not very effective. I completely agree with you at the moment. The reason for that is really, I think, it's also the media attention. So it's 150 years voluntary investment, and I don't, it's not Dutch, I mean, most people, if there's public doubt about what, you, what you're buying, um, then, then the popularity goes down. And I think what we hope is that if we can find some solid proof that it adds value to some extent, and whether it's 2.5% or 2, or there are some <coughs> economic issues we need to resolve, but I think it, th that result will stand out. And I think in the next generation you can make it clearer, but you also should communicate the message a bit better and make it more relevant for the mm. consumer. And then the 7% can spike up again. Well, yeah. Or you make it mandatory, of course. Well, uh, the new directive will uh, probably remove most of your waivers, too, I think. So you may, that'll, that'll increase the number of uh, participants. <laughs> uh, I hope so. Thank you. So just two more quick comments. Okay. Uh, the, the seller has to, buy, has to pay for it. So the seller doesn't see enough interest, even if it has an A-home, to do that. No, well, yeah. that is a puzzle yeah. why Chris is a factor. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, a quick question for, first for Dora and uh, Matthew. This morning we see Max present uh, green versus red. I'm sure that you have a plot of liberal versus conservative. But that's not my question. This is just joking there a little bit. But mainly it's a question you look at, uh, you say the house are aging, people are aging too. Okay? So I think it would be good to look at. Uh, the effect of uh, 
baby boomer like me and versus the generation X, Y, and Z, which I happen to be my daughters. So, so that's the kind of things which I think is more uh, human factors issues, okay? That's uh, just one question. The second question maybe you can sure. answer it. It's for, 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 uh, for Neil and uh, for Dirk. It's uh, about, uh, you know, you, you, you touch upon using not only the KWP, uh, K kilowatt hour, but also the CERN value. Uh, and at this conference, I haven't heard anything talk about the uh, East Bay mud type of water usage data. To me, everything is uh, this log KWP, KWH, K log CERN, log of a gallon per minute, whatever. All is uh, the total energy things. And I think you guys have the data to tackle this kind of problem. So this is a question for general for both of your papers. Thank you. Please. Just make a quick comment because I know we're trying to end. Um, I, I would strongly encourage, as someone said, um, doing a series of papers on that curve of the California versus the U.S. because it's hard to underestimate the play that that chart has gotten. Literally hundreds of people in thousands of meetings <laughs> all over the place use that chart to, to justify replicating the California policies across the nation. And I think to, to, there's been a number of pieces of uh, analyzing it, but to take one just, you know, completely comprehensive review through it would be very helpful for those, those of us who've been using the chart all this time. And on the on the housing issue, I, I know there's many other housing people here, but my understanding in California is there's been an increase in larger houses in the hotter climates. So the coastal areas with the smaller, cooler houses had been built out earlier on so that that flatness has been going on through increasing housing sizes in hotter Climates. And that, that's one of the things that needs to be incorporated, which is why Sacramento isn't completely representative of the state. It's only representative of one of many microclimates. But Great. Well, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Let's uh, thank our authors and our discussants for a very nice <laughs>